Uh, I'm Bailey Seeker and I'm playing Nelly. I'm Josh Idell and I play John Utterson. My name is Jackie Bakewell and I'm in the ensemble. I'm Gary Lizardo and I'm playing Sir Danvers Carew. My name is Ryan Hendricks and I'm the co-director and choreographer. My name is Dallas Wiley. I am playing uh, Dr. Jekyll and Edward Hyde. I am the creative director at Sponge Theatricals and I'm also the director of this production. Is this your first time playing this role? No, second time actually. I played it six years ago, really loved it. Um, it was uh, with Sponge Theatricals. Uh, Dallas Wiley was Jekyll and Hyde and he's going to be that again, him again. I've played this role twice before, once in Orlando and once here in New York when the Wings Theater used to be open. And now I've always wanted to really go darker and deeper with it, and I am. I've never worked on a show that's been so conceptualized and so different from the original concept. And it's such a great, it's such a great concept that that really drew me into the piece and got me very excited about it. The concept is different. And so my character is going to be much different than the last time. It's much darker than any other version that I've seen or listened to. Um, it all takes place in an, an asylum, so it just has like an overarching, just dark theme. A lot of the story is told through memories now. At the beginning of the show, one of the characters is already dead. Normally, you have the entire show until that character dies. At, in this production, they're already dead at the beginning. We already know it's happened. So that character can only come back through memories that Jekyll is reliving. We're watching this whole story unfold, you know, as one horrific flashback. And I think, in a way, you know, we're extremely impacted by this, but Jekyll is also extremely impacted by us because he's still working through his own insanity and, and coming to terms with it. So I think comparing himself to the people around him really adds an interesting aspect to his character. I'm just excited to see how, overall, how the um, ensemble gets threaded in throughout the story and like how that's going to play a big part in the flashbacks. Jekyll and Hyde has such a presence in the asylum at the beginning of the show. I kind of always wondered, what if Henry Jekyll is not going between two sides of himself. What if he's actually insane? And that's what we dove into. So we throw you straight into the asylum uh, after Lucy's death. We set that up from the very beginning. And from there, we go back to the beginning, reliving it through flashbacks. And that tells the story through uh, Jekyll's memories. And those are much more colorful and more vibrant and more violent than they probably really were. And that, I think, makes for a great new production. Aside from just really making a lot of creative choices while staying true to the text and not getting in trouble with the uh, copyright material, uh, uh, I think the most challenging part of putting it all together is that we have a constant presence of our ensemble in this production. We have constant living uh, asylum members. So we have people on the stage throughout the entire show and knowing where they go and where they are throughout the entire production on top of just blocking what's in the script is really, really challenging so far. This version of the production is definitely much more ensemble driven. Um, there's more moments for each person to shine and just the way the concept takes it into Jekyll and Hyde's head, you get a lot more of the other characters living in that space. So it's less just about him and more about his experience within this world and what is inhabiting that world. The ensemble, uh, we're all the mental patients who have been committed there. We all have different quirks and characters and horrific backstories that uh, tell us why we've been in this asylum. I feel like there's a lot to work with um, in this particular production. Um, spoiler, I get some fun stuff to do. <laughs> I won't say, but I'm really, really excited about it. And it's not, it's not a character that people would normally think of Bailey being. So I'm having so much fun playing something that just feels so not me. So it's great. I am so excited for this one because I play a lot of fathers. I've been playing some not very good fathers, some really dark, motivated, Fathers, and I'm bringing some of that that dark side into Danvers this time, especially when we're doing the the scenes that are kind of done as as a flashback 
from a very deranged individual. And so I'm really looking forward to that. Well, it's, it's going to be exhausting, um, definitely exhausting, but in a good way, um, in a very challenging way. Um, I found that my character is uh, really sad and really upsetting and really dark and, and puts me in a place that I have not really ventured into before in my acting career. Um, so that in itself is definitely going to require a lot from me, a lot of energy, a lot of focus, a lot of commitment. For me, it's because the character of Utterson, he's usually forgotten about, but I feel like in this production, I'm able to change that. He's a character that has more to do. He's a character that actually really does move the plot, because in the original show, he has his few scenes, and that's pretty much it, but in this, he really drives it. He and Jekyll are basically the two telling the story. I love working with the whole cast. We've recently had a few rehearsals with the ensemble as well as the leading characters, and that's so much fun to get everybody into the same room and have so much creativity just flowing in the space at once. Someone Like You, I have been drawn to that song since I was, I think, like 16 years old. I've been singing that forever. I used it for college auditions, and it's just one of those songs that just really speaks to me, and it brought on my love for Frank Wildhorn. Like, God, who doesn't want to sing one of his girl power ballads, or men power ballads, or just power ballads in general? I'm so partial to Lucy. I'm very partial to that strong female character. Um, I think one of my least favorite songs of hers before we started the process was A New Life, and now it's one of my favorites. Um, it's such a great story piece for her, and it's such a great look into that character's mind and that character's hopes and desires and dreams, and that really informs the rest of the show for her. It, it really uh, colors the character very well for the earlier parts of the show to know kind of what she's fighting against and what she's longing for. Uh, take me as I am. It just, I, I, every time I've heard, I've heard with someone with a really beautiful voice. I can't say that there's any other personal reason. I just love the song musically. It's just a beautiful song. But I really love New Life. I love what that character has to say, how it's this dream that she's always wanted, and now she finally gets to do it. She's given permission to do it now. And it's kind of unbelievable to her that I get this new life, you know, I don't have to do what I'm already doing to get by, I can leave. Dangerous Game. <laughs> I love that song. Um, it was one of the first songs that I knew from this show and it was, you know, however many years ago that I first discovered it, but I think it walks an incredibly fascinating line of really sexy and really messed up and like, I think, you know, Frank Wildhorn is just brilliant to be able to walk that line so, so well, you know, to listen to a song and be so attracted to it and the orchestration and the melody and the lyrics, but at the same time, almost find yourself disturbed at being attracted to it, you know, because of that dangerous, you know, dangerous element, so. Our costumer, Angela Borst, is just incredible. There are so many details if for nothing else, this show is worth coming to see just the exquisite work that she's doing. There's so much thought and, and craftsmanship that go into every single piece. It's truly going to make the show very special and very visually stunning. All the costumes I've seen are stunning, and I keep hearing about ones that are going to come up soon, which I'm super excited about. Her bring on the men a like Marie Antoinette theme, so Lucy is going to come out as in kind of a like Marie Antoinette inspired uh, with corset and, you know, the big hips and everything, and then me and another girl are in uh, cake-inspired outfits, which I think is brilliant and so cool, and it sounds beautiful, and she's just a wizard. It's unbelievable. She is so uh, on top of it. She's so good. What I've seen from her in several productions is just, it's magnificent, really. Really, she's wonderful. Very few off-Broadway or off-off-Broadway people actually make their own clothes. Angela does, and it's superb. The show opens May 18th, 2016. May 18th, May 18th. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm really excited. The 18th of May, and it closes the 22nd of May. May 18th. 
and we run to the 20 seconds. We're running for five performances, and our last performance is on May 22nd. Is that a matinee? It is a matinee. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it is a matinee. So if you don't have the chance to come see it at night, definitely come to the matinee. Uh, it's gonna be killer. The Players Theater is a really oh. fun and interesting space. What a cool space! I mean, and it's right in the heart of everything. I love that area of the city. I feel like it has such like a unique vibe down there, and I think this show fits really well. This production of Jekyll and Hyde is actually a benefit production for the Trinity Place Shelter. Trinity Place is a homeless shelter for LGBT youth in New York City. 100% of this show's profit is actually going to Trinity Place Shelter. They're one of the very, very few that reach out specifically to LGBT youth. A lot of them have been uh, discarded by their families. They have no place to go. Uh, if it wasn't for the shelter, they would be homeless, they would be on the streets. Doing it for the Trinity is just a great cause. It's a great program, it's a great shelter. That's one organization I, I feel very confident about donating to. Sponge's last production raised $7,000 for the Trinity Place Shelter. We're hoping to at least match that amount, or do better. All the actors, actresses, nobody gets anything. It all goes to Trinity Place Shelter, and I'm really proud of that. SpongeTheAfterGoals.com. Go buy your tickets, buy your tickets. Bye.